Did you vote for President Obama? 2008-2012? You know, this election uh, it isn't about the president. It's about know, making sure we put Kentuckians back to work. Did you and vote for I, I was actually in a way to delegate for Hillary Clinton, and I, I think that Kentuckians know I'm a Clinton Democrat uh, through and through. I, I respect the sanctity of the ballot box, and I know that the members of this editorial board do as well. So you're not going to answer? Again, I don't think that the, the president is on the ballot uh, as much as Mitch McConnell might want him to be. Uh, it's my name, and it's going to be me who's holding him accountable for the failed decisions and votes that he has made against the people of Kentucky. Ah, just answer the question. And they're going to debate tonight, I believe, uh, uh, McConnell and, and uh, Ms. Grimes. And joining us now is James Toronto, columnist for The Wall Street Journal, editor of its online editorial page, OpinionJournal.com. James, I, I know you want to grace us and treat us with a, uh, a limerick that you yes, have for... Yeah, go ahead. Yes, a reader uh, emailed me the other day uh, posing the Allison Lundergan Grimes limerick challenge. Of course, the problem is, although Allison Lundergan Grimes is, has just the right rhythm for an opening uh, line in a limerick, there are surprisingly few rhymes with Grimes, although rhymes is one of them. But I think I've come up with a definitive uh, limerick, and uh, here it is. Go ahead. Allison Lundergan Grimes is going through difficult times, but in her defense, if she had 10 cents per Obama vote, that's just two dimes. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. I like that. I like that. Uh, there's still no rhyme for oranges, by the way, which I learned as a little kid watching one of those Saturday shows. They had a whole song about how there's no rhyme for oranges. If you come up with a rhyme for oranges, I want to know. Um, anyway, um, is this, this going to hurt her? This is going to be a topic tonight in the debate, you think? Well, I don't know about the debate, but I certainly think that uh, she's in an awkward position here. I mean, I, you know, obviously Obama is very unpopular in her state. Uh, what she neglected to mention was that she was an Obama delegate in 2012 when uh, every Kentucky delegate except one, uh, a uh, congressman from Kentucky, uh, voted for Obama. And uh, the idea that uh, a Democratic office holder did not cast a vote for her candidate for her party's candidate for president <laughs> in two elections is rather hard to believe. And of course, she didn't deny voting for Obama. She just said, right. I believe in the sanctity of the ballot box. She just ended up looking very weaselly. And I, I don't think that uh, that serves her well with anyone. All right. Let's speaking of weaselly, the media has been just on a tear attacking Leon Panetta. Uh, I mean, who, you know, who's done more public service than Leon Panetta over the years uh, and in two high, high, high profile and important positions for Obama? He writes the book and they have been attacking him one by one by one. Yeah, uh, my favorite was Dana Milbank, who accused, uh, he's a Washington Post columnist who accused Panetta of stunning disloyalty. Uh, and uh, there's something odd about the idea that a uh, public servant should be loyal to the president and should refrain from uh, from criticizing him. I I mean I can I can see the argument for that sort of professional loyalty, but it's a strange argument to be for a journalist to be making. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and, and you know you talk about in your piece uh, about uh, um, Dan Burton, who all, uh, Bill Burton rather, who also uh, uh, went after Panetta, and and the media is is playing along with it. Let's talk about this Secret Service scandal. And, and here's a, a situation where the White House, like all the other scandals, denied knowing anything about it. But now we know they did know. Now we know that, that while Secret Service heads rolled, and quite properly, for the prostitution uh, scandal, uh, 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 the son of a White House donor, who was the advanced travel scout, if you will, was uh, reportedly the guy with the prostitute. He, they, the White House aides knew it. Nothing happened to him. In fact, he got promoted, ironically enough, to some women's studies uh, the division of the White House. And uh, he's still there. He's working for the State Department now, actually. Oh, he got yeah, transferred same. again? Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. He's the, 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 the women's initiative for which he's employed is the State Department. Uh, as a contractor yeah. is in the State Department, not the White gotcha. House. Gotcha. Uh, but yes, this was now, uh, we have to be careful when we're talking about the Secret Service scandal. This is the one from 2012, not the one from last month. Right. This is the one in Cartagena, Colombia, where the president was going for a summit, and uh, it kind of got overshadowed by all of this misbehavior by some Secret Service uh, agents who were on the advance team. And then it turned out somebody from the Secret Service reported to the White House Counsel's Office that uh, this uh, young man at the uh, from f who was uh, a volunteer from the White House, I uh, uh, as also as part of the advance team. Uh, had, had an overnight guest in his room, apparently a prostitute, 
Uh, I don't think this has been quite confirmed, but the Washington Post's uh, big story last week was highly suggestive. And uh, the inspector general for the Secret Service, who was looking into this, uh, told the Senate that he was urged to withhold his report on this matter until after the 2012 election. So, James, it's it's just once again, and we're out of time, just once again, another scandal that the White House knew nothing about. Always great to talk to you, sir. Read all about it uh, at at the Wall Street Journal, opinionjournal.com, James Toronto. And we'll be back, folks, with more from the panel. But first, the United States became the first and only nation to use atomic weaponry when it dropped an atomic bomb on the city of Hiroshima, leveling the city and marking the end of World War II. So why don't we take a look back now at that fateful day with this hour's American Moment. Four years, eight months, and one day after the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, marking America's entrance into World War II, a B-29 bomber nicknamed the Enola Gay dropped the world's first atomic weapon. The date was August 6th, 1945. In a split second, the world had entered the nuclear age. Captain Paul Tibbetts, Jr., in command of the Enola Gay, gave a first-hand account of the events for reporters back home. Well, as the bomb left the airplane, we took over uh, manual control, made an extremely steep turn to try and put as much distance between ourselves and the explosion as possible. With the Japanese refusing to surrender, and Allied intelligence determining that a land invasion of their homeland could result in a million Allied casualties, while killing many more Japanese, President Truman ordered the first atomic bomb be dropped on Hiroshima. Dubbed Little Boy, the device exploded 1,900 feet above the awakening Japanese city of Hiroshima, instantly reducing 68,000 of the city's buildings to rubble and annihilating some 80,000 plus people. Despite the devastation, the Empire of Japan again refused to surrender. Consequently, three days later, on the 9th, a second atomic weapon was dropped on the city of Nagasaki with the same devastating results. Still, the Japanese refused to surrender. So a third atomic bomb was being prepared to be dropped on Tokyo itself. On the 15th of August, 1945, the Emperor of Japan had announced the unconditional surrender of his nation. The greatest war known to man was finally over. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American Moment.